when you look at the nutrient requirements of NPK versus carbon dioxide for 600 bushel corn, which is where the world records are approaching, the NPK component is a little over 2,000 pounds. The carbon dioxide component is over 63,000 pounds. And here's the point that I want to make. In agriculture, we have been taught and schooled how to manage NPK, but we don't even consider the carbon dioxide requirements to grow the same crop. It's not even in the planning fertility program. Not at all. Carbon and oxygen to make CO2 cannot be purchased from a co-op. It comes from microorganisms. This is the biology, the bacteria, the fungi, the protozoa, the nematode, down in the soil, in the root system, producing CO2. They're aerobic microorganisms. They breathe in oxygen, they kick out CO2. So here's the paradox. We use salt and acid-based fertilizers. We use glyphosate. We use fungicides and pesticides, all which suppress our microorganism communities. We load on more NPK, salt and acid-based fertilizers that are toxic to microbes. They are compacting to the soil. They change the environment that favors CO2 production. And we don't even look at our CO2 requirements for our crop yields. So what I'm going to suggest is that CO2, the production of carbon dioxide from microorganisms, is the very most limiting mineral in our soils for our plants because we do not plan at all for its production in relation to the NPK usage. And I'm going to go one step further. I'm going to tell you straight out that carbon dioxide is the governor. It is the regulator of any uptake of nitrogen, phosphate, potassium, calcium, sulfur, and magnesium, period. There are no exceptions to that. When you run out of CO2, carbon dioxide, your plant will not take up additional nitrogen, phos, and potassium, even if it's there. You notice how the seasonal microbial activity matches the plant's growth stages almost to a T. And this is vital because as these plants take up these maximum amount of NPK nutrients, the equal but exponentially higher requirements of CO2 have to accompany the NPK calcium sulfur magnesium uptake. As a plant grows, it begins to add way more carbon to its structure than it does nitrogen and the other mineral ratios. So at germination, at emergence, we may have a very small plant at a carbon to nitrogen ratio of as low as 10 to 1. But as that plant grows and it adds more CO2, its carbon to nitrogen ratio will increase to 20 to 1, 30 to 1, even 40 to 1. And as it begins to mature and go into reproduction, it can be as high as 50, 60, 70 to 1. And by the time it goes through the reproduction stage to produce fruits, vegetable, grains, whatever it's doing, and translocating that nutrient from the plant into the produce or grain, that carbon ratio will increase up to 100 to 1, 150 to 1, 200, and even higher. And so this is the critical part that we need to understand about plant nutrition. As we look at plant CO2 and mineral content over the lifespan of the plant, you can see that we go from a very small carbon to nitrogen ratio up to a very high carbon to nitrogen ratio. As this plant grows, carbon and oxygen are required in huge ratios to NPK. And it keeps getting wider and wider and wider and the demand increases as the plant gets older. 
Herein lies the problem. Our fertilizer industry wants us to look at only nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium as the components that grow this crop, when in reality, it is carbon dioxide that is at an average of 30 times more than the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium sulfur requirements. 30 times more. And here's the problem. Your plant cannot rearrange its carbon to nitrogen ratio to accommodate minerals that are not there. So when your plant doesn't have enough carbon dioxide, it is not going to take up more nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium or sulfur until it gets more carbon dioxide. We never look at carbon dioxide as being a limited nutrient for our plant. We've been so conditioned to focus only on NPK that we don't even see the big picture of the plant's nutrient requirements. And so I have heard farmer after farmer say, I put on nitrogen, I don't get any response. I have nutrients in my soil, but there's no response. Your plant won't take up those soil-based elements until it has the carbon dioxide ratio to match where it needs to be as it grows through vegetation and on into reproductive stages. Plant's not going to rearrange itself to accommodate our lack of nutrient planning. This is the nutrient requirement for 300 bushel corn. Nitrogen, 330 pounds. Phosphate, 180 pounds. Potassium, 400. Sulfur at 150. So we've got a total of 1,060 pounds of mineral required at these various growth stages. And you can see the uptake pattern of the plant. You have to remember, every one of these plants has a very specific nutrient uptake pattern when it wants the mineral at the time that will function in its physiological development. So they're all coming in at different levels at different times, but they all have to be there. Now, let's look at the carbon dioxide requirements for the same 300 bushel corn. Almost 32,000 pounds of carbon dioxide is required to grow that 300 bushel corn crop. And I need scarcely over a thousand pounds of mineral. So this is the ratio that we're not seeing. We don't even look at this. We farm completely absent of the CO2 requirement for our plants. As you can see, the seasonal microbial activity mimics perfectly with the plant's nutrient profile uptake. The first high peak of microbial activity is in the same place and time as the peak mineral uptake of the plant. It comes down a little bit into reproduction cycle as they start, and then there's another peak as the plant begins to fill. And you'll notice in late summer, there's another microbial activity peak. The microbe and the plant mineral uptake are in the same pattern all the way through the season. This is because the CO2 content coming into the plant has to be in a ratio to the minerals of NPK, calcium, sulfur, magnesium that also have to come into the plant. And so if the CO2 isn't present, again, you're not going to be able to utilize the NP and K that we've intended for part of the plant's nutrition. These both, the CO2 ratio to the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, sulfur, magnesium ratios have to stay in their proportionate ratios for this plant to function and grow. And if one is short, the other 
is not going to come in and the plant will wait until it has either the CO2 or the NPK so it can move forward. Wheat, 100 bushel wheat requires 570 pounds of nitrogen, phosphate, potassium, and sulfur. And these are the growth stages and when it is going to come into the plant. Look at the CO2 requirements for that 100 bushel of wheat. Over 17,000 pounds of carbon dioxide. A 75 bushel soybean crop will require 771 pounds of NPK and S. And this is its nutrient uptake pattern. Now look at the 23,000 pounds of carbon dioxide that have to come into the plant along with the mineral ratios. The carbon dioxide contribution of a plant is a staggering amount of nutrition to be completely unaware of and not managed for in our plant production. Let's look at the alfalfa carbon dioxide requirement versus the NPK calcium sulfur magnesium requirement to grow eight ton of alfalfa. We need roughly 1,100 pounds of the NPK type minerals, yet we need over 33,000 pounds of carbon dioxide. As you look at your natural microbial activity on a seasonal basis, you can see that we have a very strong early summer, late summer, but in the fall, it tends to taper down. And this is why you have a very good first cutting, typically a good second cutting, a smaller third and a much smaller fourth. It's because our CO2 contribution is coming down because of our microbial activity. Here's a story of an alfalfa crop that we did in Nebraska in 2010. And it illustrates this carbon dioxide necessity perfectly. This was on a large alfalfa, wheat, and corn farm in Alliance, Nebraska. And I talked Ted into introducing much more biology through his pivot on his alfalfa crop. He applied approximately 15 gallons of microbial mineral tea per acre through his pivot. That was the 1st of August of 2010. Ted called me back at the end of August and said that that pivot had produced the best crop of alfalfa he had ever grown. Ted sent me pictures of the crop and said that the alfalfa was up over the luggage rack on his four-wheeler. And you can see that the alfalfa is right up to the top of the metal rim on his pivot tires. After he cut the crop, the crop tonnage had increased by 36% on his third cutting, which was greater than his first cutting. Ted continued this practice into 2011 and his fourth cutting alfalfa crop was up 63% from its normal yield. Ted's neighbors were still getting three cuttings per year. In 2011, Ted got a very big fourth cutting because his microbial activity was much higher in his soil and the CO2 production allowed for far more NPK, calcium sulfur magnesium uptake to produce such a big crop. The most critical thing about the increase in crop production was not only did we have much more forage to harvest, but the feed value of the crop also increased as its tonnage increased. The total digestible nutrient increased every cutting. And in 2012, Ted got five cuttings off of his 
pivot. We were trying to reach 10 ton per acre in alfalfa production. This field was already eight years old and it produced 9.8 tons in 2012 with five cuttings. Every year we had Dairyland Labs verify the quality of the feed because the tonnage was increasing and increasing. After a rotational crop, Ted replanted in 2014 the alfalfa with the biomineral seed treatment. We had excellent germination, an excellent stand. It was very thick, very healthy. Once the stand was well established in 2014, Ted harvested over 10 ton of alfalfa to the acre in 2015. What we did to make this dramatic of a change from his normal three cuttings to year to five cuttings per year was simply increase the CO2 availability in these fields. We didn't add more phosphate, we didn't add more potassium, the alfalfa fixes its own nitrogen. And so it was the CO2 that was the limiting factor on this alfalfa production. Once we increase the biological populations within this soil, the cuttings kept increasing, the quality kept increasing, and we did not increase the NPK type synthetic fertilizer applications whatsoever. This was all biological carbon dioxide CO2 driven. This is a perfect example of where managing CO2 makes a huge difference in crop production. What we learned from this five year period with TED was that there was plenty of phosphate availability as was potassium, sulfur, calcium, magnesium. It was all there. What we didn't have was adequate CO2. And once we supplied that factor, these crops had a wonderful response, not only in quality, but quantity. Section four, summary. There is a critical importance to understanding that we need the CO2 to be in the proper ratios to other minerals so the plant can grow and function. CO2, carbon dioxide, is needed at much larger ratios than any other elements. Carbon to nitrogen ratios increase throughout the entire life cycle of the plant. Plants will stop growing as soon as it runs out of the first limiting element or mineral. And without adequate CO2, the plant cannot use NPK, calcium, sulfur, magnesium, even if they're in the soil, even if they're soluble, the ratios have to be there for both the gases and the soil minerals to come in. Microbes activity matches the activity of the CO2 requirements in plants. Both of these have to occur at the same time. Crop quality and quantity can increase with better CO2 management. NPK, calcium sulfur magnesium inputs are the main focus of crop production. CO2 is the driver for high yields. CO2 is our crop's most limiting nutrient.